Alrighty, hey guys, I just spent the last two hours designing the latest feature for Seeking Sigma that we're about to ship to customers in the next week. And I thought, you know what, it might be really good if I just spend some time and record a video walking you through exactly what I built um, and sort of how I approached it, um, all the way from sort of having the initial idea for the feature to building a working MVP, something that I can play with here as a spreadsheet, and then literally jumping into Figma and designing the product and then incorporating it within the whole Seeking Sigma ecosystem. Um, and I think it will literally show you behind the scenes of how I approach building a product, walking through everything. Um, I'm gonna show you, you know, my approach to design. Um, and I think it's just real and raw. And if you're in the process of either designing a product or you're thinking about building one, I think it will be really useful to see the thought process that someone goes through uh, when they are building their own. All right, so let's just jump straight into it. Um, before I sort of walk you through my process, um, I think I need to give you some context around like what Seeking Sigma is and how it works. Um, so let's start with that. So Seeking Sigma, um, it's actually the main project that I am working on at the moment. Um, and it is a way that we work with SaaS companies, either existing SaaS companies who want to scale or people who are wanting to start their own SaaS. And we sort of provide uh, consulting, a ecosystem, a community, as well as a series of tools and perks, which enable them to essentially achieve product market fit a lot quicker or scale a lot faster. Right, I don't wanna to dive too much into it because you know this is not a pitch, um, but just to give you some context, this is the new uh, software that we're gonna be shipping to customers. And within that, you have process, you have docs, community, but then relevant to this video, within the tools section, there is a series of tools. And so we've built a suite, if you wanna call it, of tools that are very useful to help SaaS founders in their journey of running and managing and scaling one, right? Now, specifically, I've had this idea for a while, which is a growth modeling tool. Because one of the things that SaaS founders, I think, find really difficult to manage or understand is, first of all, how do I hold myself accountable in terms of numbers? Like what numbers should I be hitting on a consistent basis? And also how much should I pay myself? How much is the company expected to make? So I know, you know, how to hire and how much to spend on payroll, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is their feature that we're building and, and that is the user that we're targeting. Okay, so um, when I start thinking about, I wanna build something, um, whether it's a feature or even a company, whatever it is, I literally follow roughly the same step process roughly. Um, I always start out with um, just a document um, or a note, just because it's a lot easier to work with than jumping into Figma or something quite complex, right? Text is very easy to manage. And I basically start out by working out what is the outcomes that I want to deliver? Like what is the things that I want this product to achieve? Before I get into what am I actually building and what is the product gonna look and feel like and all that stuff, just like what is the end goal? What is the, the, the picture? Then what I do is I talk about, okay, uh, this is what I want to achieve at the end. How can I translate that into something that's tangible, something that I can actually build? Uh, and then what I do is I sort of uh, value prop it to myself. So I look at its value proposition and I sort of pitch myself on it. And then I assess, is it worth me building it? Because now I know what I'm going to build. I can see like, is it worth building all of this? Like, is it actually going to get the value that I want? Um, and then from there, I, I build an MVP. And I play with the MVP and I see if I can get the results that I want. And then once that sort of is checked off, then I actually design it. Um, and then I send it off to the developers. And then obviously we start user testing it. Okay, so let me walk you through my thought process here. Um, these are the things that I wanted to achieve. The first thing that I wanted to do is when I work with founders, um, one of the, the big questions that they have is like, what metrics to track? Because if you're working in a SaaS, like you can track a million metrics, right? There's so many things you can track. What is the main things? That's actually a, a question that most people have is like, what metrics should I track? So I wanted a very easy way to sort of simplify and highlight what metrics to be tracking. It sounds like a very small thing to do, but I think it's very valuable based on so many people asking me the same question over time. So that's the first thing that I wanted to do. The second thing that I wanted to do is once you know what to track, the next thing is creating accountability. So first of all, there's the accountability of actually tracking the metric and sending the data. But secondly, once you have a previous list of data, you can use um, forecasts and prediction to predict that if the trend stays constant, what should the next value in the table be? And this is very useful because if I'm looking at your, your growth curve, right? And I'm predicting how many users or subscribers you're going to have based on your current growth, I can hold you accountable. And if you miss that number, it means that your growth has slowed. And that's a problem. Like why is your growth slowed down? Right? So I can actually ask founders those hard questions, which Considering at Seeking Sigma, most of what we do is consulting, it's extremely useful for me to be able to actually hold founders accountable to like, look, based on your growth numbers, this is what you should be achieving, why are you not? Or you are achieving it and you're exceeding it, 
what is working so that we can do more of it, right? Having that accountability and feedback loop within a model that is very math and very visual based, I think is incredibly powerful. The third thing is also like we can use this as a sales tool. So this is um, great for users and selfishly, this is great for us because I've been reviewing uh, my team's sales calls and sort of looking at ways to increase efficiency and increase conversion rate. And one of the things that I found extremely valuable is people, at least my customers, they like to buy based on certainties based on uh, logic, not based on I'm selling you some pipe dream. And so if we have the ability to forecast numbers, we can use it as a sales tool. And my thinking behind this was, if I take all of your data and I forecast what your predicted growth is supposed to be, then I can play with the metrics. Let's say you had a 2% conversion rate. And I say, look, you're currently converting at 2%. If you work with us, your conversion rate should rise to 5%. And based on that 3% delta between the 2% and the 5%, and the same prediction algorithm, this is the difference between how many users you will have in the next three months if you work with us versus how many users you will have if you don't work with us. And then once you have that, you can look at like the dollar value of those users and say, well, if the difference between working with us is building a business worth 10,000 or a business worth 100,000 and you only have to pay us a fraction of that, this is super logical. And if I guarantee it based on the math working out, it's a no brainer decision, right? Which is incredible. Okay, so selfishly, I think that's super valuable. And also even for my team, it holds ourselves accountable. So that's sort of what I wanted to achieve at a, at a high level view. Then what I did is I started working through, okay, with this is what I wanna achieve. How do I translate this into like something that I can actually work with? And the first thing that I sort of came to the conclusion is the hard part is deciding on which metrics to track and the math behind them. Because ultimately, like if you have a look at this, we have nice graphs, we have fancy, um, bar charts, we've got nice colors and everything looks super nice, but really like if you made this ugly and it showed the same data, technically it would have somewhat sort of the same value. I have the belief that design carries a lot more value than most people give it credit for, but like just on, on paper, if it shows the same numbers, even if they look less pretty, it's the same numbers. So actually the hard part is the math, right? The prediction formulas behind them. So after that, I sort of decided, well, if the hard thing is deciding on metrics and the math, then actually I can just build this in a spreadsheet first, because if it's in a spreadsheet, I don't have to worry about design, don't have to worry about design language. I can just play with numbers and play with math. And so I sort of came to the conclusion that the first thing that I need to do is build a spreadsheet. And if I can get a working spreadsheet and I'm happy with it and it's, it's delivering on what I want, then I can translate it into design. So that was the first realization I had. Then what I had is I thought about this black box concept. And so this is super useful and I encourage everyone to think about software like this. If you think about your software as a, as a black box, right? You usually have a pipe or a wire going into the black box and then you have a pipe or a wire going out, okay? And the pipe going in represents what users are giving you, so user data. And then the box, the black box, represents what's happening in your software. So people interact with your software, but they can't see the things going behind it. For example, you're interacting with these graphs, but you can't see the math and the formulas that are running to actually predict these graphs, okay? So that's why it's called a black box. And then the pipe out is the end result that the person gets when using your software. So essentially what happens is you give us data, right? We then use it in our little black box to do math, do magic, and then we spit out this, we spit out forecasts, right? That is the pipe in box and then the pipe out, okay? Um, and then finally, when I was thinking about this, I thought one of the things that I wanna do is show trends, okay? And I'm gonna talk about this uh, churn should be trending down when I jump into the spreadsheet now, but that's sort of like what I was thinking about is also a side value prop is if I can build this and our, our customers use it and they show it to their investors, it will enable them to get more money, um, get a lot more recognition for what they're doing, potentially even hire more people because they can show patterns, right? That's very, very important. Okay, um, right, so once I'd sort of walked through that, before I built a spreadsheet, before I literally built anything, again, I'm just working in the same document, the next thing that I did is I sort of came to the conclusion, okay, I know what I want to achieve and I know sort of how I'm gonna do it um, and I've thought through everything. Now let me sell myself on the idea before I commit any time. So literally writing all of this probably took me five minutes. This next part took me another five minutes. And then I made a decision on if I was going to commit two hours or not to actually building it out. So the first thing that I, I came to the conclusion of, this is massive in terms of helping me as a consultant, because what it does is it enables me to number one, track customer growth metrics, which firstly, forces them to actually give me the data on a weekly basis. So there's accountability from the founders that I work with to actually give me the data. But secondly, like I've Currently, I ask uh, customers to give us growth data, right? Obviously, to hold them accountable, but every customer gives it to us in different formats. Some of them have like uh, Stripe, some of them have you know different 
analytic software. Some of them have spreadsheets. It's just a bit of a mess. And so now every customer will be able to give me data in the same clean linear way. And so that I can compare customer to customer and it's just easier to work with. Secondly, I can hold them accountable because based on their data, I can tell you what they should be achieving growth wise. And realistically, if you're a startup, your growth numbers should be beaten week on week, month on month, right? Otherwise you're not growing fast enough. So I can actually hold them accountable, which is amazing for me. Like it makes my job a lot easier. So that's like massive. Next, it's massive in terms of sales calls as I can look at your data, predict the returns and then make a guarantee. So I think it will dramatically help me from a sales perspective, um, which is the selfish side. Um, and then also like segueing into it, it's actually perfect from a demo point. Because if you look at like, let's say I was selling you Seeking Sigma and I sort of do this whole modeling thing and I predict, you know, if you work with us, this is going to happen. If you don't work with us, this is going to happen. And the difference between working with us and not working with us is so huge. You would be stupid to say no. The next question the person is going to have is like, okay, well, if you're going to achieve that, like, how are you going to do it? And that segues perfectly into me demoing our product because the next thing I can do is I can jump into the doc section and the process section and really sort of walk them through it. So it actually works perfectly from a sales motion. And by the way, I think that this is the best way to build products and features. If you ask yourself, does this help our customers while also helping the company? And if the answer is yes, then I genuinely believe you're working on the right thing because it's very easy to build things that are only useful to the customer, but not to the company and vice versa. And then you end up with this weird balancing act. But if you can achieve both, I think you're on a winner. Okay. So after that, I sort of came to the conclusion, okay, I think that I can build this. I think it's worth building. And I also think it's going to be relatively quick for me to build. So let me just give myself two hours and see what I can do. Right, so then what I did is I uh, jumped into um, this spreadsheet. And again, like if you have a look at this, it's it's super ugly spreadsheet, nothing fancy, but it works. Um, I'm not gonna run you through everything, but I'm just gonna run you through sort of my thought process and then really just show you how I took a working model um, and sort of transferred it into software. So the first thing that I did is I thought about, okay, I need data, right? Like this, this thing does not work without data. So let me first ask, what data am I going to prompt from the user? There's a decision that I made here. The first decision is, do I want to build an integration where like someone can just, for example, connect their Stripe account or whatever, and I can just pull the data, or do I want to create a form that someone has to fill out? And I made two decisions here. One, building integrations from a de developer standpoint is way more complicated. It's going to take lots more time. It's going to cost more money. And for an MVP feature like this, like the first time rolling it out, I don't know if that's worth it. But two, also from just a UX standpoint, I thought, no, I want the customer to enter their data on a weekly basis because then it forces them to be accountable and actually log the data. Whereas if it just syncs automatically, it defeats that purpose. So I made the decision. I want to force the person to give me the data and I want to give it in a form. So then I thought, okay, cool. Well, what is the, the data that I'm going to need? What am I going to ask in a form. And again, I started out just by making a little list here and you can see like this essentially eventually turned into this, right? So you can go from a very small little spreadsheet into something that actually is, you know, a real life software. But in the beginning, it was literally just, you know, a, a little bit of text on a, on a white background. Okay. So once I had the data, what I did is I essentially took this data and I mapped it into a table. Um, and then what I did is I created fake data. Okay. So I just entered random numbers, um, based on sort of what I've seen in the, the industry and sort of what, you know, I, I think is, is reasonable. Okay. Um, so a couple of things that I want to sort of uh, highlight here. So the date obviously is a date, nothing there. T users stands for total users. Uh, this little triangle represents the Delta. So essentially what this is measuring is the percentage growth from the previous entry to this one, right? So you can see the formula that's running there. Um, all it's doing is basically just working out the percentage growth uh, difference between previous entry and this one. Um, because this is the first entry, it will always be an, it will always generate an error if you run the math. Um, so I've just told Google Sheets that if it generates an error, it must um, just automatically show a color. Okay, so that's why the, the, the changes are grayed out for the first row. Um, then what I've done is I've got an MRR. And um, what I've done with this is, again, I just entered, you know, random data based on what I thought. Um, T, total subscribers. Again, measuring the percentage change difference. Um, and then the conversion rate I sort of mm, made up, but also realistic from what I've seen in, in um, the industry. And then what I've done is I've modeled um, how many customers have churned. Okay, so what you're looking at here is like the final version of the data that I made up. But I went through many iterations of changing data based on wanting to test this. So the first version was like very simple, but then I sort of thought about what are all the, the if, if this algorithm works correctly, what are things that I should be looking for? The first thing is I wanted the growth at some point to be negative because I want to be able to show how the, the subscriber um, conversion rate or change rate will dramatically increase the conversion rate. I wanted to be able to show a, a massive drop here because this sort of shows that the algorithm is working if I can show what happens when there's a negative number. Because if I didn't have this, and I launched it, 
I would only know that it works for positive values. So I just wanted to throw a negative value in there just for testing. That was the first thing. Secondly, I decided to keep the number of users uh, who churned constant throughout the data set. And the reason is because I wanted it to show this pattern. So this is actually a really good lesson if, if you're in, in software. A lot of clients come to me and they say, what should my churn value be? They sort of just ask me like, what is the industry benchmark? And I find that it's the wrong question to ask because yes, I can tell you roughly what I think your churn should be just based on working with a lot of companies and sort of knowing in my head, but I don't think it's the right thing because I think churn is very arbitrary. It doesn't matter what your churn number is, whether it's 1% or 90%. What matters is the trend. Is the churn decreasing week on week? Because if churn is going down, it means you are moving closer to product market fit, and it means that you are moving closer to a product that is gonna have low churn. And the trend of the data is more important than the data itself, right? Because you can start here and work your way into a better position, or you can start with an amazing number, but it's consistently getting worse and worse and worse. And then if you just extrapolate time, then you know it's gonna end up in a bad place anyway. So here you can see churn is slowly decreasing. So again, um, I actually think I put that in my note over here, um, but this is what investors look for. Investors don't look for what is your churn. Like they don't care, they actually care what is the trend of your churn because that's more important. Okay, so I wanted to sort of show that um, trend in the data. Then what I did is um, I just ran some, some math on it. So what I'm doing is I'm just averaging it. Um, and the reason for that is I thought, okay, well, here's data. Now I want to predict things. So in order to predict things, um, you know, any prediction formula is the same. It requires inputs, it requires an algorithm, and then it spits out numbers. So I thought, what inputs do I need for a prediction algorithm? And I need sort of the, the growth change rate. I need the um, conversion rate. I need the revenue per subscriber so I can work backwards on the MOR. And I need the, the churn rate, okay? Now this row here, the average days between entries, I actually didn't have in, in my initial version. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that just now because I think it would be useful to sort of see how I arrived at a finished version. Um, so then I jumped into the forecast and I thought about, okay, well, what numbers would be useful to forecast? Because here there's like a lot more columns and it's not useful forecasting these things because the way that a prediction algorithm works is it uses a constant gradient, right? The, the gradient can't change. Um, otherwise the prediction algorithm goes wonky. There are ways to offset it, but now it's like getting very complicated and I just didn't think it, it needed that. So there's no point displaying the user change rate because the way the formula is working is it's using the same percentage and it's using the average of this column. So that's a redundant column displaying it again because every value is gonna be constant. So I just deleted it, right? So I simplified the, the, the columns dramatically. Then what I did is um, I copied this. So this uh, over here just represents a copy of the, the previous table. And that's because when I was working in this spreadsheet, I was trying to make sure that the values were the same. And then when I was working in here, I got tired of flipping between tabs <laughs> and I was also getting confused. So I decided just to duplicate it. So that's all this is, is just a, a duplication. Then um, the way a prediction algorithm works, this is like super, super, super simplifying it. So if anyone who's listening to this is like super into math, you'll have to keep, forgive me. But essentially prediction is Y is equal to MX plus C, sort of, right? Like essentially. So essentially Y is your output, M is your, your gradient, so the value that you're using, um, and then X is your, um, your input that you're feeding it, right? And then you have a uh, intercept curve, right? That's sort of roughly how we're thinking about this. So I'm simplifying it to make the case that essentially what I'm doing is you need a starting point for any prediction algorithm. So the starting point, I decided to use the previous line of data because that's the most up-to-date. Um, and I didn't think taking the average would be fair because it wouldn't predict the next steps, right? So I took the, the latest value. So all this is doing is it's literally just fetching the latest values in the, the bottom of the spreadsheet. Um, then what it's doing, again, very simple. I'm, I'm not gonna walk you through the formulas because it's just boring and it's, it's just math. But basically it's taking the original values, it's applying the gradients, which are the averages of the previous data, um, and then it's spitting out forecasts. And then what it's doing is it's using the forecasted data as an input for the forecast of the next data. So this, this first line uses these inputs, which is the, the previous data as the forecast. Um, and then this next line uses this data, the previous line as the inputs for the same algorithm. And then it just forecasts again and again and again. Um, when I did this, initially I had like a long table and I was predicting like 16, 20 values. And then I sort of thought, as you increase the number of values, the likelihood of it being wrong increases exponentially. So I'd rather just display four values, which is in this basis, it's, it's roughly a month because it's, it's spaced weekly. Um, because I think that gives you the, the, the most accurate sort of approximation. I think if you go a lot further than that, like you run the risk of just the numbers being very wrong. And then if the numbers are very wrong, 
what happens is, that, and, and people miss it, they're gonna get discouraged, which sort of defeats the point. So I decided to only show four values. I might change this when we ship it. Um, you know, Once this actually goes live with customers, we'll be able to see how people use it. Um, and then I might change my mind, but for now that's what I decided to do. Um, and then what I did is I initially thought, okay, I want founders to log their data uh, every single Monday, right? Just once a week. And so that's why if you look at these dates, you'll see that they're all spaced weekly, okay? And so what I was doing is when I was running the prediction, initially I was just adding seven days. So it was just like taking the dates plus seven days. But then I thought about it and I was like, people don't follow rules. Like if I might tell founders log their data weekly, they might log it like every 10 days. And then what's gonna happen is if it's still adding seven days every time, the data is going to be wrong because then what it's doing is it, it's it's forecasting based on a weekly split when the, the people are not entering it every week, right? So what happens if there's user error? And again, part of building solutions like this is to account for user error. So then I sort of came to the conclusion, okay, I can't rely on people doing it, so I'm gonna have to work it out. So then I added this, um, which basically what this is doing, this is actually a very like complicated formula. I don't know why Google Sheets made this complicated. I, actually, I had to like Google it. Um, I didn't realize that there's, there's like forums for Google Sheets, which I thought was quite cool. Um, but yeah, I had to figure that formula out. But all it's doing really is just working out the average days between the dates. Um, and then what the um, formula is doing is it's taking that average and applying it across the model. Okay, so um, that gave me a working sheet. Then what I did is I literally just like played with different values um, and I sort of ran the forecast and sort of made sure that it made sense and I checked it and I was super, super happy with it. Um, and then as I said, I thought, okay, well, how do I show trends? So I did the, the constant churn. How do I you know, work backwards on all these things? Um, and I sort of came up with what you're looking at here, which I was super happy with. Um, and then I also thought about um, doing a mock sales call. So I did like a mock sales call in my head. Um, I actually went and reviewed one of the recordings so we record our sales calls. And if I was on that call and I had the sheet, I entered their data and you know it would have it would have blown them away. Um, so I was like super happy with it. So cool, I had a working spreadsheet. Then I was like, okay, let me jump into Figma and, and start designing. And um, honestly, this probably took an hour and a half. The actual design in Figma probably took 30 minutes. Um, so that sort of shows you that most of the time building products goes into thinking about the solution and working like on the rough core elements. The design is just like the side part, right? Okay, so um, this is the design file that we have for Seeking Sigma currently. So um, I just made some copies of it. Again, that's probably why it was quite quick because the design language is already somewhat sort of established. Um, but anyways, so we did that. What I did is I started out by saying, um, if I go back to my uh, issue list or the things that I wanted to achieve, the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to highlight what metrics to track. So I started out with the design by highlighting those metrics, okay? And you can see that these four metrics represent the uh, four metrics that are running in my table. And that's because these are the metrics used for prediction, okay? Um, then what I did is I needed to essentially take this uh, spreadsheet and turn it into um, a design. And I did that, but then I just thought it looked a little bit boring. And I thought, you know, the thing is like, this is just data in a table. And some people are very good at data and, and spreadsheets and they, they like that sort of stuff. Uh, but some people also just need a little bit of visual aid. And I think the power of building a software instead of just using a spreadsheet is the fact that you can make things very visual. And so then I decided to add these two graphs. And it's sort of a balancing act between, do I add a lot of graphs or a few graphs? How many graphs do I add? I decided to add two um, and I decided sort of to track in my opinion, like the most useful things, first of all, is just MRR, you know, what direction is it trending? That is sort of the hero metric for a SaaS because like your churn can be wrong, like conversion rate can be terrible, like all the metrics can be wrong, but if MRR is going up, the business is not gonna die, right? Like that's sort of how it works. So that's the hero metric. It's also the one that is the most egotistical, like that's what strokes people's egos, like is the MRR growing or not? So I thought I'd highlight that and just very easily show it over a trend. Um, the next one that I thought about, because I basically played with all these numbers, the conversion rate didn't make sense to show on a graph because it's it's like there's too many data points of it going up and down and also it's, it's almost very constant or it should be at least. So like that's a bit pointless. Same story with churn. Revenue per subscriber. Again, most startups have like one or two price plans and the average is usually constant. So like, again, that's almost a flat graph. So it didn't really make sense. So I played around with things and I came to this. I think this is a useful uh, graph to show. It basically shows the, the gray bar is users and the black bar is um, subscribers. So it basically shows your conversion rate, but in a very visual aid, um, which I think is actually quite useful for people to see how much of essentially money you're leaving on the table if the gap here is very big. So added the graphs. Uh, and then what I did is I um, essentially took these tables and I converted them into um, designs. Now, the, the next thing that I did before I, I talk about the tables is um, obviously I, I went here and I said, okay, um, this is what 
um, information I need. Let's create a way for users to give us the data. So I added a little um, add data button, which brings up this prompt. Um, obviously the fields and stuff I copied from exactly what I needed over here. Um, and then we had already established the pop-up designs in some of our uh, previous designs. So I um, just used the same design language, um, very simple pop-up, um, but yeah, it is what it is. Then I went to the table um, and the first thing that I did, again, I'm just walking you through sort of like some UX design thinking that I had here, um, forecasted data. In the AI world at the moment, whenever you see this like magic star sign, you basically think AI. This is not really AI, but it's sort of kind of is like, it's a little bit of a bluff to say, yeah, we use our AI to predict your growth model. Technically we could say that, but like, it's not actually AI, but most people who build AI at the moment, it's not actually AI. So it's a little bit of a bluff on my part, but I mean, I, I still think it, it, it holds weight. So I decided to add the little magic icons. I also just thought it, it's very nice for users to see the difference in a very visual way. Um, and then I thought I'd add this little note because I was very aware that I don't want users to take this data as gospel because it is a prediction, it's not accurate. So I added this little note here, um, which was, uh, and I obviously matched the colors just from a design standpoint. Then what I did is, um, again, just this is a, a spreadsheet uh, from a software standpoint, we can make things look a little bit better. So I described, I decided to just add these badges with some colors and things just to make it, you know, look a little bit cleaner. The only other thing that I want to highlight from, for you guys, from just like a UX design standpoint is, um, when I was thinking about the actions that I want users to take on these columns, I wanted users to be able to delete and edit, uh, delete because maybe they made a mistake. And if they made a mistake and they can't delete it, it's going to completely change the algorithm. Number one. And number two, the edits is actually very important because again, remember on sales calls, we need to be able to edit data and show users what the difference would be if you worked with us or not. So that was sort of my design decision there. Um, but then on the forecasted data, you obviously can't edit it because it's forecasted. So it's based on the underlying data. So I thought, well, this is going to be empty because there's going to be no actions but why don't I put the AI sign there? Because then from a UX standpoint, you know that it's pre-generated and this goes into like UX design thinking. But if I took this edit button and I put it in the middle or on the left-hand side, you as a, as a human wouldn't be able to exactly tell me why, but you would just feel weird. Like it would just feel out of place. And that is a result of decades upon decades of like UX ingrained in your brain. Like I don't think people realize this, but your brain is literally being trained from the very first time you use the computer to expect certain things to be in a certain place, right? Like if I put this trash can in the middle or on the left, it would feel weird because every software puts it on the right hand side. So instinctively, you expect an edit button to be somewhere on the right. So I thought if I put the magic sign there, it sort of encapsulates that very well. So that was sort of my uh, design process. Um, very, you know, simple and intuitive. And then the last thing that I added is I thought, okay, if I was using, I was using this, I may have some questions or I might not understand how data is forecasted. And that's going to like clog up my customer support teams, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided just to add a little button here uh, that says need help. And when you press that, what it does is it brings up a pop-up and uh, in this pop-up will be a loom or a video of me essentially just walking through the spreadsheet and walking through the, um, walking through the explanation of it um, so that people can always access that uh, training as they go. And that should realistically reduce support by quite a bit and also make sure that people use this properly because they understand how it works. And then the other thing just to touch on is obviously I added a switch bar um, between this because you know this is one tool and we're building out um, several other tools. Um, I think that is everything to highlight in the design. And then the last thing is once I was finished with it, I just went back to my uh, notes and I sort of said, have I delivered on everything? So yes, it's now very usable on sales calls because you can edit data and, and it's also very visual because you can see the graphs and stuff. Um, is it useful for accountability? Yes, because you have the previous data over here and you can compare previous data to actual data. Um, so that's great. And also you can see this trend very clearly because uh, you'll be able to see the, the trend over here with the, um, the churned users. And so that will sort of be useful if you're trying to pitch this to investors. So. I was like, right, it took me two hours. I have delivered on everything. Um, I have a working MVP, so I know the underlying values of it is true. Um, I think it looks good. It looks like a Seeking Sigma tool, matches all my specs. So um, I'm happy with it. And about two hours later, I was done. And I um, now it's been sent off to the developers. And um, we should be shipping this to the Seeking Sigma customers, I believe, next week, which is very exciting. 
So yeah, just a, a real and a raw video behind the scenes of what it's like to build something like this. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. Any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.